This is a verse that's near and dear to me, so I just want to start with this and then we'll say a prayer. 1 John chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 7. <clears throat> this is a promise, but you also see it's a, a conditional promise. And it says in 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So did you catch that? The condition is if we walk in the light, then we have the promise that Jesus will cleanse us, right? And we will have fellowship one with another. Beautiful promise. And as professed followers of Christ, what could we want to do more than to walk in the light, right? So keep that in mind as we go along in the study. It's a powerful verse. Let's go ahead and have a prayer. Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for watching us through this last week and bringing us into another Sabbath day. We thank you for your long suffering with us. We thank you for the blessings that we have seen happen in our life, but even more so for the thousands of things you've taken care of without our even realizing it. Help us to have the faith that we need in you and your word, in your unlimited power that we need to be able to stand with what things are soon to come upon this world. Wash us clean of our sins. Give us a love of the truth, a love of the light, so that we may walk in the light, so that we may have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, will cleanse us. Thank you for these things. In Jesus' precious name I ask. Amen. So the shepherd's voice, and the question for all of us, especially myself, is are you listening? And, and last time I was here, we went over into a little bit of detail exactly what that means for us here at the end of the world. And so we're going to do a quick recap, and then we're going to look at one of my favorite and also one of my most challenging examples of this in the Bible. And I want to start with this quote from the Review and Herald which is taken uh, from March 26, 1889, which says, The masterly temptations of Satan will overpower many who now profess to believe the truth. Their unworthy course of action, their denial of Christ, will make it necessary for God to blot their names from the book of life. We don't want that. We want our sins blotted out, right? And so this is what becomes, and we're going to see the seriousness of walking in the light, and how this all comes together. And may our love of the shepherd's voice and our ability to recognize the shepherd's voice be of the same enthusiasm that you see that little lamb having. You can just see maybe the shepherd is out there outside of the picture there calling him and he is running towards his shepherd. And that's what we want to have. So John chapter 10 verses 1 through 5. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So in other words, the shepherd of the sheep goes in by the appointed way, right? And what does the robber do, the thief? He goes in a different way. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Okay, so you catch that? So here's the sheep, 
representing us? And do we know the shepherd's voice? And how would we do that? And we definitely don't want to know the voice of strangers. We want to recognize them as strangers when we hear those voices. And how does that go about? How does that happen? And so we went and we looked through and we saw that it is a, actually how we study the scriptures is how this happens. And in Review and Herald 1884, we're told this bit of information. Said Christ, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Again, he said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. The light of truth is going forth like a burning lamp. And those who love the light will not walk in darkness. So they won't walk in darkness, but the big question is, what will they do? They will study the scriptures that they may know of a surety that they are listening to the voice of the true shepherd and not that of a stranger. Just what we saw in John 10, right? And we saw after that that the pen of inspiration then tells us that how that happens is by a study method that first, in the, at least the modern era, was put forward by William Miller. And it's most popularly or commonly known as Miller's Rules, and they consisted of 14 rules. And we went over those last time. And I have extra handouts. Um, if someone can hand those out to those who didn't get that or would like another copy, just raise your hand. And if someone can come around, they're in the back right there. And, um, and we can hand those out to those who either didn't get them or would like another copy. And going over in specifics those rules. But basically, the gist of those rules is it is a way of self getting out of the way. It is a way in which we let the Bible speak for itself and get ourselves and our own opinions and our own ideas, leave them at the door of investigation and allow Jesus to speak. And by doing that, we're learning to know the voice of the shepherd. And by learning the voice of the shepherd, we will not be misled by the voice of a stranger. And as we saw, that's a huge difference. So, the shepherd's voice. Why is that so important? And the biggest reason that's so important is, do you know, everybody hears a voice. Everybody. So the important thing is making sure that we are listening to the right voice. And so, and from Review and Herald here, 1886, listen carefully to this quote. It states, Every warning, reproof, and entreaty in the Word of God or through His delegated messengers is a knock at the door of the heart. It is the voice of Jesus asking for entrance. With every knock unheeded, your determination to open becomes weaker and weaker. If the voice of Jesus is not heeded at once, it becomes confused in the mind with a multitude of other voices. There's the voices of strangers. The world's care and business engross the attention and conviction dies away. So this becomes a very serious issue that we can recognize and know the voice of the true shepherd. So again, notice it's through the word and through his prophets. Now this is an interesting conversation that, that Spirit of Prophecy had with somebody a long time ago, but it really brings this point home. And she was talking to this individual and she tells him, don't bring your suppositions to the Bible, but lay your ideas at the door of investigation of the Scriptures. Take the mighty assertions that God has given, and you are safe. A certain man who kept the Sabbath, but did not believe in the second coming of Christ. So notice you catch that. He believes the Sabbath, but not the second coming. Said, I have made a center, a center, that it was not so. So they, he made a center that the second coming of Christ was not so. So he decided that's not true. And then the scriptures proved to my mind that the second coming of Christ was not near. So he, did you see what he did? He came to his conclusion. He stood firmly on his conclusion. And then he went to inspiration. And what was the purpose of going to inspiration? Simply to prove his point. All right, so he's, he already had come to his conclusion, and then he went to the Bible, and lo and behold, it proved him right, because he only was going to look for what would tell him what he wanted to hear. See, that's another voice. That's another voice. Okay, notice what she says, though. Are you going to make a center of Sunday as the Sabbath, and then come with unmitigation to the Scriptures? And unmitigation means unsoftening. You know, you're not going to soften that stance. You, I, not movable. 
Okay, so you're going to come and you're going to say, my position cannot change, so the Bible has to, the inspiration has to conform around me, because I'm not going to conform to it. Are you going to make a center of Sunday as the Sabbath, and then come with unmitigation to the Scriptures? If you do, you will surely hear a voice. Catch that. Believe not in the fourth commandment as it reads. So remember, the Bible, this is why it's so important that we allow inspiration to speak for itself. Because unknowingly, we all have biases, we all have preconceived notions. Not one of us is immune of this. And if we don't set these things aside, we bring them with us. And without even realizing it, we try to study to prove ourselves correct. That's just human nature. We tend to do that. And this is the warning that we have, because if we do that, we will hear a voice. But remember, the concern is, is do, we want to know for sure that we're hearing the voice of the true shepherd. That is what we want to be concerned about. Because what will that voice of the stranger do? Is he going to lead us in the path of righteousness? He might keep you close for a while just to get your confidence, and then what's going to happen? When he thinks he's got you, he's going to take you on a turn. And so this becomes very important. So remember, everybody hears a voice. You think those lambs, do they look like they know there's a wolf next to them? That's the voice of a stranger, but they're not recognizing it. That also brings to uh, thought the verse in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. If you want to write that down, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So notice, what are the itching ears? That means that they want their ears scratched, which is a way of saying that they want to hear what they want to hear, right? And that's, again, the human condition is we want to hear what we want to hear. And so we'll find somebody, and this is what it means by you will hear a voice, they will find somebody who will tell them what they want to hear. You see, we can't trust ourselves. This is dangerous. In commentary on that in Acts of the Apostles, we find this statement. The apostle does not here refer to the openly irreligious. So this isn't talking about outside the church. But to the professing Christians who make inclination their guide. What do they make their guide? Inclination, their own feelings, their own, own ideas, their own preconceived notions. They're going to it with a purpose to prove themselves correct. They want to hear what they want to hear. And thus become enslaved by self. Such are willing to listen to those doctrines only that do not rebuke their sins or condemn their pleasure-loving course. They are offended by the plain words of the faithful servants of Christ and choose teachers who praise and flatter them. So itching ears, they, they want to hear what they want to hear. That's the voice of strangers, okay? And it becomes very dangerous. Another important principle that we didn't get to last time is that in inspiration, there is nothing that is non-essential. Jesus doesn't play games with us. We don't want to play games with him. And he doesn't give us anything that is non-essential. Everything that he gives us, he gives us because we need it. And we can see this in Signs of the Times. He who will search the Bible with a humble, teachable spirit will find it a sure guide, pointing out the way of life with unfaltering accuracy. This book contains nothing that is non-essential, nothing that has not a bearing upon our lives. It teaches man how to simplify life's complicated experiences. I don't know about you, but I really like to know how to simplify life's complicated experiences. It is an educator endowing the simple-hearted followers of Christ with the wisdom that comes from the author and finisher of their faith. And then we're told in letter 106, 1907, the Bible must be your counselor. Study it and the testimonies God has given, for they never contradict his word. So we see here that nothing is non-essential, which means that how much of it do we have to take into account? All of it. Right? And that's really what Miller's Rules is all about, is that we are allowing inspiration to speak as a whole, as a unit, as if it had one author, which we know it does. So there's another important principle before we get into this story, and that is that the prophets speak more for our time. Did you know that? Did you know that every prophet that has come before us, whether they understood it or not, was speaking more to us at the end of the world than they were to their own time? even though we know they were speaking to their own time. 
But yet, they were speaking more to us than to their own time. And we can find this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. And Paul tells us, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So we can see that every story in the Bible, every portion of it throughout inspiration, actually is geared towards us. So when the Holy Spirit was leading those individuals to write these things down, they, the Holy Spirit was looking to that last generation on earth more than he was looking at the generation in front of that prophet. And we can see this developed even further in letter 74, 1897. Never are we absent from the mind of God. God is our joy and our salvation. Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in force for us. So how much of it is in force for us? All of it, right? Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10.11 Not unto themselves, but unto us did minister the, the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So the angels in heaven desire to look into these things. You know that the angels in heaven are studying inspiration. You also should know that Satan is studying inspiration for different reasons. But nonetheless, they realize these things are important and they realize these things are especially important for the last generation. In the next paragraph in that quote that we were just reading, it says, The Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasures for this last generation. All the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. So how much of it applies to now? Right? So it becomes very important for us to make ourselves aware of the lessons that we are given because these things are repeating themselves. So one of the stories in the Bible where this really brings home the importance of knowing the voice that I've struggled with probably more than any other is the story of Abraham. And so this morning I want to take a look at that and kind of give us an overview and just kind of look through that. And if you want to, when you go home, look through this, Abraham, the story of Abraham starts in Genesis chapter 11, towards the end of Genesis chapter 11, and it goes all the way through Genesis chapter 25. And uh, that sum, that's spans the entire of Abraham's story in the Bible. And so, we're going to start with a statement that God says about Abraham that we need to take note of to understand all this. And it's found in Genesis chapter 18, 19. And Jesus, and the Lord is speaking, He says, For I know Him, speaking of Abraham, I know Him, that He will command His children and His household after Him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So two things. Notice the Lord knows him. Wouldn't you like to have the Lord be able to say that? I know him. I know that he will follow me. I know that he will command his household to follow after me. And in letter 9, 1904, we're told Abraham did not allow Satan to control in his household. He realized the responsibility of the work committed to him, and he did not betray the sacred trust placed in his hand. He did not yield to the enemy who was striving to gain control in his home. He honored the law of God. Did you know Abraham knew the law of God? He did. And strove earnestly to bring those in his charge up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So the Lord... So, looked down and he saw Abraham. Who else does that make you think of? Job maybe? Or he looks down and he says, I know, Job, that he will. You know, he is walking in my ways. He commands his household after him to walk in my ways. So this is the testimony of the Lord about Abraham. Now there's a couple important details we need to get right from the beginning because the Bible puts them right at the beginning. And the first one you find in uh, Genesis chapter 11. And that was the fact that Abram's wife, Sarai, was barren. 
And uh, so let's read this from uh, Genesis chapter 11, 29 and 30. And Abram and Nahor took their wives, took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. And there's an example how the Bible oftentimes will tell you what something means. So you don't have to go even to a dictionary, it just told you what barren means. I have no child. I are not able to bear a child. So this is clear back in Ur before they even come out. It's already a stated fact. They'd already figured this out, that they had been unable to have children. So this is a theme that goes behind the entire story as we go forward. The second thing that we have to understand is that Abram had been preserved from idolatry. And uh, this is from uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. The Lord selected Abraham to carry out his will. He was directed to leave his idolatrous nation and separate from his kindred. The Lord had revealed himself to Abraham in his youth and gave him understanding and preserved him from idolatry. He designed to make him an example of faith and true devotion for his people who should afterward live upon the earth. Does that sound somewhat like 1 Corinthians 10, 11 right there? Right? So the Lord was actually was already setting things up so that the example of Abraham could be an example down here at the end of the world. Did you catch that? But he had been preserved from idolatry. Now there's some important things that we have to understand about idolatry. And this is from Signs of the Times, 1880. The first and second commandments spoken by Jehovah are precepts against idolatry. This sin, if practiced, would lead men to great lengths in rebellion and would result in the offering of human sacrifices. So adultery, the end result of adultery, if allowed to go long enough, always ends in human sacrifices. That's how it ends up. So if you want to think someone following the true God, they're not going to do that, and anyone on an idolatry, you're going to eventually see that happen. It's going to end up. It's just the nature of the beast, if you want to put it that way. God would guard against the least approach to such abominations. So when Abraham was preserved from idolatry, see, he was being preserved amongst all the other things, but he was also being preserved from being caught up in the terrible, heinous act of human sacrifice. Keep that in mind as we go forward. Gives you a little insight into where Abraham was and what he's going to have to struggle with. So the call of the shepherd first comes to Abram when he's still in Ur, and this is Genesis chapter eleven thirty one. 31. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, that would be Abram's nephew, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the commentary on this is, the call from heaven first came to Abraham while he dwelt in Ur of the Chaldees. So he was first called of heaven. And in obedience to it, he removed to Haran. Thus far, his father's family accompanied him, for with their idolatry they united the worship of the true God. Here Abraham remained till the death of Terah, but from his father's grave the divine voice bade him go forward. So he had left with his father's family, and they'd gone to Haran. But what, there was an issue with his father's family. What was it? They were mixing idolatry with the worship of the true God. And so God had to take him still further. Remember, because he was being preserved from idolatry. And so when Terah died, and we find this in Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 4, the Lord called Abraham again to move forward. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And that's a reference to the Messiah. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So he leaves Haran at the age of seventy-five and without any 
children. 75 years old. Sarah's 10 years younger, so she would have been about 65 at this time. Okay? Now the Lord had just told him what? He's going to make of him a great nation. What would he need to be able to become a great nation? He's going to need some children, right? Patriarch Prophets, page 125. There was given to Abraham the promise, especially dear to the people of that age, of a numerous posterity and of national greatness. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And to this was added the assurance, precious above every other to the inheritor of faith, that of his line the Redeemer of the world should come. And these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Yet, yet, as the first condition of fulfillment, there was to be a test of faith, a sacrifice was demanded. Now, this isn't the sacrifice you may be thinking of. This was that he had to leave everything. <clears throat> it was no light test that was thus brought upon Abraham, no small sacrifice that was required of him. There were strong ties to bind him to his country, his kindred, and his home, but he did not hesitate to obey the call. So he passed the condition, didn't he? Now, here's an important point. Many are still tested as was Abraham. They do not hear the voice of God speaking directly from the heavens, but he calls them by the teachings of his word and the events of his providence. And that's what we've been talking about, right? That is through the study of his word correctly and rightly dividing the word of truth that we learn to recognize the voice of the true shepherd. And if we're not rightly dividing the word, we'll be hearing a voice, but that voice may not be who we think it is and that's the dangerous thing and that's what we have to understand and take this serious but there was a problem so God had brought Abraham out of idolatrous Ur Babylon and it was bringing him into Canaan but there was a problem about Canaan you know what it was there were Canaanites the Canaanite was then in the land and this is uh, Genesis 5 through 7 chapter 12 and Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran and they went forth to go unto the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land into the place of Sikkim unto the plain of Morah and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So the Lord had just promised him that he was going to give unto his seed this land, but what was the one problem? He had no seed. And not only that, there were the Canaanites. So he had just been brought out of, preserved from idolatry, where they were doing human sacrifice amongst all the other things that were involved with idolatry. He comes into Canaan, where there are Canaanites, and guess what they do? Patriarchs and prophets. But to the worshiper of Jehovah, a heavy shadow rested upon the wooded hill and fruitful plain. The Canaanite was then in the land. Abraham had reached the goal of his hopes to find a country occupied by an alien race and overspread with idolatry. In the groves were set up the altars of false gods, and human sacrifices were offered upon the neighboring heights. While he clung to the divine promise, it was not without distressful forebodings that he pitched his tent. You think him saying, what am I doing here? <laughs> how's, this, how's this better than where I was, right? You can just think about that, you know? He's got to be wondering. But this is all a test of faith. Do we know the true voice? You know, we don't have time to look at the quote, but... Um, we're told that the Noachian world, the world before the flood, one of the primary sins that required the destruction of the flood was human sacrifice. So keep that all in mind as we go forward. So Abraham settled down, and, and we're going to skip through some details. He, he went down into Egypt with the famine. He came out of Egypt. And after they come back up out of Egypt, 
Lot and he have to separate because they're both doing so well that they need more space. And so after he and Lot separate, we're going to pick this up in Genesis 13, verses 14 through 17. The Lord reiterates, gives him the same promise again about the seed. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Once again, Abraham, Abraham has how much seed? Right? And how old is he? He's over 75 years old now. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Can you imagine being told that? Then shall thy seed also be numbered. And you can imagine him probably thinking, I'd take one. Right? Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So again, the promise is reiterated again. But still, there's no seed. Again, the promise is given to him. So after, the next thing that happens is uh, Keterleomer and his group come and they take the cities of the plain, right? And they take them all captive along with Lot. And Abraham goes and he, he, he count, conquers them and he brings everybody back. And right after that, the Lord gives this promise again in Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? So he's going, little, a little detail here. You may not have noticed, but I don't have any kids. Childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. So you know, he's get, here, he keeps hearing this promise, but he keeps saying, Hey, you know what? There's something missing here. <clears throat> No seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So now the Lord just got a lot more specific, didn't he? Because Abraham was thinking, well, Eliezer may be the one. But God just told him that it was going to be his child. Okay? And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And here's a beautiful verse. This is righteousness by faith right here. And he believed in the Lord God, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So he says, all right, Lord, I don't get it, but I believe it. And that's something we have to keep in mind is belief is not based on whether it makes sense to us. Belief is taking God at his word and acting on that, okay? So he's been told now that that child will be your own. Now, what should have that also told him according to the ways of the Lord? That that child would also be Sarah's child, right? Okay, because God only works within his appointed ways. He doesn't work outside of those appointed ways, and this was a test on that. But in chapter 16, we see them trying to help God out. And there's an important principle we need to understand before we go forward, and you can find this in Manuscript 112, 1901. In every stage of this earth's history, God has had his agencies to carry forward his work, which must be done in his appointed way. And that's an important principle, is that the Lord always works in his appointed way. He doesn't go outside of that. And just because it doesn't seem possible that it can be going forward in his appointed way does not mean that he's going to change how he works. That just means we don't understand. And that's a big difference. So in 16, Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my maid, 
It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Was this a voice of a stranger at this point? It was, wasn't it? Coming, using his wife. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he's now 85. And gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So, you know, th let's stop and think about that for a second. Because remember, Abraham believed, right? We saw that in chapter 15. He believed when the Lord said, you will have seed. Abraham believed. And you could almost see how maybe even in his mind this could be James. Faith without works is dead. And so maybe you could see in the rationale that they were actually acting upon their faith to help out the Lord. But what was the problem? It was out of the appointed way. It was out of the appointed way. And when it's out of the appointed way, it's not faith. It's presumption. So the work must be done in heaven's appointed way. This is the Sister White's commentary on this. In the beginning, God gave to Adam one wife, thus showing his order. He never designed that man should have a plurality of wives. Lamech was the first who departed in this respect from God's wise arrangement. He had two wives, which created discord in his family. The envy and jealousy of both made Lamech unhappy. When men began to multiply upon the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, they took them wives of all which they chose. This was one of the great sins of the inhabitants of the old world, which brought the wrath of God upon them. This custom was practiced after the flood and became so common that even righteous men fell into the practice and had a plurality of wives, yet it is no less sin because they became corrupted and departed in this thing from God's order. So when God said, Abram, it will come from your bowels, what Abram should have understood is that it will also mean it's Sarah's child because that is the ordained way. But what was in the way? Human wisdom, right? From a human perspective, medically, how many 65-year-olds have babies, right? And not only that, she had been barren since she was young, right? So you can see the odds stacking up in the human mind and the human wisdom to say, this can't be, Lord. I believe you, but I think you need a little bit of help, right? And that was the rationale. And you can't fault him for it. It's not, I mean, how many, let's be honest, have found ourselves thinking on different topics maybe that way, not even realizing it. But we're going to see that it was actually a lack of faith in the unlimited power of God. So in Genesis 16, 16, we see... Now, let me read the quote in Spirit of Prophecy first, 95.2. If Abraham and Sarah had waited in confiding faith for the fulfillment of the promise that they should have a son, much unhappiness would have been avoided. They believed that it would be just as God had promised. Now remember that. They believed that when he said, you will have seed, you will have seed. But there's something else. But they could not believe that Sarah, in her old age, would have a son. So they said, it's all good, we get it all, but it's impossible for Sarah to be the mother of this child. It can't be. So that was the part that they had trouble with. Sarah suggested a plan whereby she thought the promise of God could be fulfilled. She entreated Abraham to take Hagar as his wife. In this, they both lacked faith and a perfect trust in the power of God. By hearkening to the voice of Sarah and taking Hagar as his wife, Abraham failed to endure the test. So he failed this test. Remember, he had passed the one earlier when he had left Ur, when he had left Haran. But this test, he now fails. Abraham failed to endure the test of his faith in God's unlimited power. Do we have faith in God's unlimited power? Or do we put limits on God's power based on our understanding, what we think is possible, what makes sense to us? 
If it fits what makes sense to me, then I believe it. But if not, I think that's a little bit far-fetched. You see, this is, this is the same dilemma that Abraham was being faced with. So it brought much unhappiness. The Lord intended to prove the firm faith and reliance of Abraham upon the promises he had made him. So Abraham, if he had just stood on those promises and said, nope, he said, that child's going to come through us and uh, we'll just wait. It would have worked out. But because of that, and, and we all have it, because in our human wisdom, we can't conceive something as possible. And see, this is the lesson, one of the lessons that we must get out of the story. And in Genesis 16, 16, Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So Abram was 86 when he became a father. Now, of course, he loved his son. And so he hoped that his son would be the son of the heir of the, heir of the promise, right? And so now we go to chapter 17. In chapter 17 is now after that. And now he's 99. And so Ishmael at this time would be about 13 years old. And so we pick this up in Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Remember, his faith had not been perfect, right? And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations I have made thee. So the Lord's now telling him, I'm going to make you a father of many nations, and to show you how serious I am about this, I'm going to change your name to the father of many nations. Just to let you know, I'm going to make it happen. Right? And so again, Abram, is he going to believe his word? And We go further down in the same chapter, verses 15 through 18. And the Lord continues, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. So now he's getting more specific, isn't he? He says, it's not just going to be that you're the father. Sarah is going to be the mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. Can you believe that? Well, it is preposterous to the human mind, right? And sit in his heart. Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? He didn't believe they were going to have any more, right? You're going to see. He's putting all these, everything's in the Ishmael basket. Shall a child be born unto him that, uh, that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. So he's still looking to Ishmael to be the, the fulfillment of the promise. And God's still trying to spell things out for him, right? He's still working with him. So that's Genesis 15, and we go, or 17, sorry. And this is from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. After the birth of Ishmael, the Lord manifested himself again to Abraham and said unto him, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Again, the Lord repeated by his angel that promised to give Sarah a son and that she should be a mother of many nations. Abraham did not yet understand the promise of God. He believed him. He believed he'd be the father of many nations, but he still couldn't believe that Sarah could be the mother. Abraham did not yet understand the promise of God. His mind immediately rests upon Ishmael as though through him would come the many nations promise. And he exclaims 
in his affection for his son, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Can you understand his point of view? Can you understand how he's looking at us? You know, this is the thing we need to do with inspiration is we need to see how they were just people like us and uh, that they struggled with these things and it'll help us understand the struggles when we're going through them. That this is not something that is so easy as it appears when we're looking at through a telescope that's 1,500 years removed. It's a lot easier when we aren't right up in the face of it. And so in Genesis chapter 17, verses 19 and 20, it continues. And God said, so he's reiterating what he just told him about Sarah. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. So Abraham had just pointed to Ishmael, and the Lord pointed him back to Sarah shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. Now remember when he told him that earlier in this chapter, what did Abraham do? He laughed. What does Isaac mean? It means laughter. Isn't that funny? You shall, name his, you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him. Now he's not saying with you. He's telling you, look, it, Sarah's going to have a boy. You're going to name that boy Isaac, and I'm going to establish my covenant with that boy. That's not here yet, but I am telling you it's going to be him. Whether you understand it or not is regardless of the point. And with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him faithful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Now, don't you find it interesting that ultimately, how many tribes come out of Abraham? Twelve. And we have how many sons for Ishmael? Isn't that interesting? Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1 states this. Again, the promise is more definitive, definitely repeated to Abraham. Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So notice now the Lord to make a point is not just making this promise with Abraham. He's making this promise with Isaac who does not yet exist. He's called him by name and he's told Abraham it's with him. The next chapter, chapter 18, this occurs when the Lord comes down to examine Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy the plains and the cities and the three beings come and visit Abraham, right? Because he's now Abraham, not Abram. And in Genesis 18, 1 and 2, it states, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now we know that these three individuals were heavenly beings and one of them was none other than Jesus himself, right? <clears throat> and this is uh, verses 9 through 15. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well-stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So now there's another check against the cause, right? It's, it's impossible on multiple counts. Old, no longer biologically functioning, barren since young age, and the Lord is still saying, no, nope, it's going to be Sarah. And uh, so remember in chapter 17, Abram laughed, right? So now it's Sarah's turn. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? This always amazes me how he deals with this here. You want to see how the Lord deals with something? This is amazing. Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which, which am old? Is this thing too hard for the Lord? See, what's the issue here? The unlimited power of God. Do we really believe in the unlimited power of God? 
Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. So he doesn't say anything mean. He's not rough on her or anything like that, but he gives it straight, doesn't he? And we need to remember that about the Lord. He's loving, he's kind, he's just, but he never compromises the truth in that process. And notice, he doesn't let Sarah wiggle out of the facts. She laughed. And so here we have another time that it's getting more and more specific that the Lord is saying, Abraham, do you understand? I mean what I say. When I tell you it's Sarah, it's Sarah. When I tell you it's you, it's you. And in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, <clears throat> we're told angels are sent the second time to Abraham on their way to destroy Sodom, and they repeat the promise more distinctly that Sarah shall have a son. And so Abraham was, Abraham was 99 years old when that happened. And so now we're in chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him, which means Sarah was ninety. Same chapter, chapter 21, verses 9 through 12. So now there's an issue, right? Because now there's two moms with two heirs, and both of them are thinking that theirs is the heir. But we know we're already where God's position is, but now it's got to be figured out in the home, right? And 9 through 12, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. So he was mocking Isaac. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for this son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. You can see that, right? Can you imagine how difficult of a position that would be for Abraham? He loves them both. They're both his sons. He would like them both to be heirs, right? And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. Remember, he hearkened unto her voice once before, and it was the voice of a stranger. But this time he's hearkening unto her voice, and this time it's the voice of the true shepherd. See, we ha how do we know the difference, you see? This is where we have to be studying and, and rightly dividing the word of truth. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So the Lord is saying, Isaac is the son of promise. Isaac is the one I promised you. And Isaac is the one whom the promises are going to be fulfilled through. If God had sanctioned polygamy, this is a Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, he would not have thus directed Abraham to send away Hagar and her son. He would teach all a lesson in this, that the rights and happiness of the marriage relation are to be ever respected and guarded, even at a great sacrifice. Sarah was the first and only true wife of Abraham. You see, in the eyes of heaven, there was only one wife of Abraham, and that was Sarah. She was entitled to rights as a wife and mother, which no other could have in the family. She reverenced her husband, calling him Lord, but, he was je but she was jealous lest his affection should be divided with Hagar. You can understand that. God did not rebuke Sarah for the course she pursued. Abraham was reproved by the angels for distrusting God's power, which had led him to take Hagar as his wife and to think through her, to think that through her the promise would be fulfilled. So you see, it was complete presumption on his part to think that the promise could be fulfilled through Hagar. It was completely out of line with God's way of working. It was out of line with his appointed way. And this, again, underlines the importance of studying by the rules because if we are going to know God's appointed way at any given time in history, 
It is only through rightly dividing the word of truth. And we might be doing things with, the, with good motives and the right desire, but if it's outside his methodology, it doesn't matter. Do you think they intended well when they came up with the idea that Hagar be brought into the picture? They meant well, didn't they? Right? They, they thought they were just helping the Lord fulfill his word. You see? But it wasn't the case. And so we really have to understand these things. It becomes very important that we understand the importance of knowing what the Bible says for itself, knowing what the spirit of prophecy says for itself. So this brings us to the toughest part of this story. So we've got all this history, right? We've got, we've got Sarah's been barren since way back. We've got Abram being preserved from idolatry, which the pinnacle of idolatry is human sacrifice. Abraham has been a pillar of, for the worship of Jehovah in a land of heathen saying this is how you worship the true God we do not do things like you do like human sacrifice and so this is the backdrop if you're going to understand Abraham's mind of what he's going to have to be dealing with because now he's going to be faced with a test that in some form or another we all are going to be faced with and we need to understand that Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. This is the same one God spent years convincing him he was going to give him. Right? Thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Can you imagine that? Think of it for a second. So God spent how many years from, for God spent, this is, he's 120 right here. So God spent uh, 25 years convincing him Isaac was going to be the one, and Sarah was going to be the mother. And then they got Isaac. And they had 20 years. Isaac's now 20 years old. We're going to see Abraham's 120 when this happens. And now this one that took so long to convince him was going to be the, the, the promise through everything was going to come through. Now God's going to say, give him back. If you can, if you can imagine the turmoil, I, it's incredible when you really sit down and think about it. At the time of receiving this command, Abraham had reached the age of 120 years old. So Abraham is now 120 years old. That means Sarah would be only 110. And again in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, again the Lord saw fit to test the faith of Abraham by a most fearful trial. If he had endured the first test, catch this, remember the whole thing with Hagar? If he had endured the first test and had patiently waited for the promise to be fulfilled in Sarah and had not taken Hagar as his wife, he would not have been subjected to the closest test that was ever required of man. The lesson may be easier to understand than always to be able to do, but the lesson is learn the first time <laughs> because it will come around and it will not be easier. The second time is always more difficult. So as much as we can, let us learn the first time. So the Lord bade Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah, and offer him there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now, if Abraham didn't know the voice of the true shepherd... Can you see that he would have a lot of issues with that command? And wouldn't it seem justifiably so? Right? Can you see what's going on here? This is, this is tough stuff. Well, you can be sure, and we're going to see here, that Satan was on hand to help him out with that. Satan was at hand to suggest that he must be deceived. For the divine law, can, did you know Satan will use the Ten Commandments for his purpose? He will use anything if it will work for him. For the divine law commands thou shalt not kill. That's what Satan was saying. Wow. That will make you start sweating now, right? We're Seventh-day Adventists. We understand the Ten Commandments. We profess to keep them. 
And now Satan is the one that is pulling the law card. Thou shalt not kill, and God would not require what he had once forbidden. So Satan tells him it's wrong to kill. It's against the law. And furthermore, God would never require you to do something that he has forbidden. But apparently that's not true, isn't it? What about, you know, there it says uh, he would not require that which he had once forbidden. What about he would not forbid that which he once required? If one's possible, the other could be as well, right? So these, this becomes really important. Going outside his tent, Abraham looked up to the calm brightness of the unclouded heavens and recalled the promise made nearly 50 years before that his seed should be innumerable as the stars. If this promise was be, to fill, be fulfilled through Isaac, how could he be put to death? How could he be put to death and the promise be fulfilled? Isaac hadn't had any children. That's tough, isn't it? Abraham was tempted to believe that he might be under a delusion, and you can see why. In his doubt and anguish, he bowed upon the earth and prayed as he had never prayed before. And this was a praying man. For some confirmation of the command. Give me a second witness. All right? And make sure I heard that right. If he must perform this terrible duty. But was he given a second? No. It continues. He remembered the angels sent to reveal to him God's purpose to destroy Sodom and who bore to him the promise of the same son Isaac. And he went to the place where he had several times met the heavenly messengers hoping to meet them again and receive some further direction. But none came to his relief. Darkness seemed to shut him in, but the command of God was sounding in his ears. You see, he knew the voice. He knew the voice. That's the only thing that could see him through this. He knew the voice. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. That command must be obeyed, and he dared not delay. Day was approaching, and he must be on his journey. Genesis 22, verses 3 and 4. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of God, which unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. So he travels three days. Okay, after he leaves. Now we saw that Satan was tempting him that whole night after he had gotten the command. Right? You think he stopped when Abraham started on the journey? He kept right on working on him, didn't he? And we'll see, he kept going back to his ace in the hole. All day, speaking of Abraham, he cherished the hope of meeting an angel coming to bless and comfort him or perhaps to revoke the command of God, but no messenger of mercy appeared. Satan was still at work. Satan suggested that he must be deceived. For God had said, thou shalt not kill. Man, is that an overpowering argument? Think about that. Isn't it true what Satan said? Didn't God say, thou shalt not kill? Wow. And it was not like God to require what he had once forbidden. There it is again. God would never require that of you what she had forbidden. The second long day comes to a close. Another sleepless night is spent in humiliation and prayer. And the journey of the third day is commenced. Abraham lifts his eyes to the mountains, and upon one he beholds the promised sign. You see, he had been given a promised sign, but he would not receive that sign until he had went. A bright cloud hovering over the top of Mount Moriah. That was the sign he had been told to look for. Now he knows it is all a terrible certainty and no delusion. Verses 5 and 6 of chapter 22. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. 
And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Verses 7 and 8. He said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Can you imagine? We need this faith. We need to know the voice like this. Abraham believed that Isaac was the son of promise. So now, see, he had been convinced. He, he, he had it down now. He believed that Isaac was the son of promise. No, the Lord said it was Isaac. It doesn't matter. It's Isaac. He also believed that God meant just what he said when he bade him to go offer him as a burnt offering. So he's trying to make sense of it. Isaac's the promise. I need to sacrifice Isaac. How does this work? How's he going to figure this out? Right? This is what the rules in our Bible study does for us. How to figure out these contradictions. He staggered not at the promise of God, but believed that God, who had in his providence given Sarah a son in her old age, and who had required him to take that son's life, could also give life again and bring up Isaac from the dead. And you, find, you can find this in Hebrews chapter 11, but he said, fine. God told me Isaac's the promise. God told me to sacrifice Isaac. Well, if God's going to keep his promise, you know what he's going to do. He's going to raise him back up. And if that's what he needs to do to keep his promise, that's what he's going to do. And he believed that. Do you think he's passing the test on the unlimited power of God at this point? Is his faith in the unlimited power of God now different than before? You see, this is what we have to have. We have to have this faith in the word and the unlimited power of God. Genesis 22, verses 9 and 10. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar the wood, and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Unless one's in this situation, I, I can't think that one can even really have a, a true and accurate concept of how difficult this would be. Verses 11 and 12. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Let me ask you a question. If Abraham had not known of a surety the voice of the shepherd, what would have happened? Thou shalt not kill. God will not require that which he has forbidden. Can you see that there is no way that he would have passed that test except that he knew the voice of the Lord for himself? There was no other way. And this is why when we look at this and this method of study that we were talking about last time with Father Miller's method of study, this is the foundational principle to knowing Jesus. This is the foundational principle for letting the Bible and the spirit of prophecy speak for themselves and speak what Jesus intends them to say. And so it's, this is why it's so important and the same reason it was so important for Abraham to know the voice for himself. We must know the voice for ourself. Genesis 22:13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And we all know that that is pointing towards the father doing exactly what Abraham was asked to do, but actually having to go through it. You see, Abraham didn't have to go through it, but the father had to go through it. And Jesus had to know the voice of the father. You see, we have to know the voice. 
And it's through the correct methodology and the correct study of inspiration that we learn that voice and we know that voice. Abraham has now fully and nobly borne the test and by his faithfulness redeemed his lack of perfect trust in God, which lack led him to take Hagar as his wife. After the exhibition of Abraham's faith and confidence, God renews his promise to him. Genesis 22, verses 15 through 18. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. You see how that theme just is on and on and on? It's the voice. We must know the voice. Remember we read 1 Corinthians 10, 11 earlier that all of these stories are for us, especially at the end of the world? This is taken from Signs of the Times, 1879. Those who profess to be looking for the soon coming of our Savior should have Abrahamic faith. A faith that is valued because it has cost them something. A faith that works by love and purifies the soul. The example of Abraham is left on record for us upon whom the ends of the world have come. We must believe that God is in earnest with us and that he is not to be trifled with. He means what he says and he requires of us implicit faith and willing obedience. Then will he lead, let his light shine around us and we shall be all light in the Lord. Amen. One last quote. After me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Again, he said, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. The light of truth is going forth like a burning lamp, and those who love the light will not walk in darkness. They will study the scriptures that they may know of a surety that they are listening to the voice of the true shepherd and not that of a stranger. Hopefully the story of Abraham gives each and every one of us a little bit more of an idea of the importance of not just studying the Word of God in the spirit of prophecy, but by rightly dividing it. We must study it as we are told to. We must study it as it was designed to be studied. The more we do that, the more Jesus will speak. The more Jesus speaks, the more we will know his voice. And we must know his voice to get through the tests that are coming before us very soon. So it is my prayer for all of us that we all are inspired by the Holy Spirit to take those rules. I hope everyone got a copy of the cheat sheet that wanted it. Take those rules and begin to apply them personally to your own study. The more you do, the more you're going to find inspiration is going to open up in a way that you've never seen it before. And it's going to start speaking in ways and with authority and with power that you never imagined until you start to let it speak. Self is set aside. Jesus is uplifted. The Holy Spirit is the guide. And the more he speaks, the more we will be guided into all truth. Let's go ahead and uh, those who can kneel for prayer. Our kind Heavenly Father, again, I want to thank you so much for all the incredible light that you have given us in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. For we know that it is all there for us. None of it is non-essential. Every bit of it you put there, you put it there because you know that we need it. And we know that every single prophet, every single story was written actually more with us in mind at the end of the world than even the people to whom it was spoken. Please, with the Holy Spirit's power, ingrain these truths into our hearts and minds. Help us to know these things with the purpose of obeying them and living them. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to have that Abrahamic faith that is necessary. 
Thank you for your long suffering with us. Thank you for not giving up on us. In Jesus' precious name I ask. Amen.